just when we need it. Uh, it is sorely needed, it is urgently needed. We know that we falling know that short of this goal would be catastrophic. The most recent, some of the scientific assessments I've heard it described as we are on the abyss, we are on the edge of the abyss, and we've got to have immediate action. Catastrophe should not be acceptable to us in our state or in our nation. So we're very happy about these developments on the federal level. And we're very happy about the things we are doing locally to fight uh, climate change and restore and protect our environment. This morning, I, inter I, I toured the Ecos company in, in Lacey. Uh, what a cool company. This is a company that makes a whole host of products, cleaning products, that are environmentally sound and manufactured in a way that reduces waste, reduces water pollution, and reduces carbon pollution. This is the only manufacturer in America that has won national awards for all three of these to reduce waste, to reduce water uh, usage, and reduce carbon pollution below acceptable levels. They have won the, the trifecta, the, the triple crown of environmental protection. And they're right here in Lacey, Washington. This is a woman of minority owned business. It's also focused on diversity and empowerment. I got to meet their, their staff that have used innovation to keep everybody safe from COVID at the same time they're manufacturing uh, uh, products from natural ingredients. And to me, it was just a proof right here at Lacey that you can have a very robust, successful business. They have four manufacturing sites across the nation to produce earth-friendly products in a way that actually reduces carbon pollution at the same time. This shows economic growth is goes hand in hand with environmental stewardship, and we're proud of, uh, that they are here in Washington State. We're also seeing great things in our schools. Today, the U.S. Department of Education named Anderson Island Elementary a Green Ribbon School. It's honor bestowed on institutions that have reduced environmental impact, reduced cost, and improved health, and offering, uh, has offered sustainable education. They've ambitiously and effectively incorporated uh, the outdoors right in their classrooms. They've organized local cleanup efforts. They've restored creeks to health, and they're building an ecosystem one salmon at a time. They're educating their students and their staff on how to conserve energy. Uh, between seeing business leadership and ECOS, which gives a, a, a bonus to their employees when they live close to work so they don't have to have transportation costs, to this school, good things are happening right here in the state of Washington. And we are uh, excited about the prospect of the legislature joining these efforts by passing a good, strong climate legislation this year. Uh, the legislators today are working on a clean fuel standard that will give consumers more choices, cleaner choices, a way to reduce air pollution in our, in our clean fuel standards bill. They're working on the Climate Commitment Act which will make a commitment to reduce carbon emissions to fight climate change in the state of Washington. These will also, both of these, particularly the Climate uh, Commitment Act, reduce air pollution in our overburdened in our communities. These are communities that have been swallowing way too much pollution, frequently low-income communities, communities of color, who've had to breathe and have their children breathe and have have to suffer asthma as a result of this, and this bill has the, will have the strongest protections, the first ability to prevent overburdened communities from having to breathe that, that material in the United States. We're very proud of this particular bill, and I'm happy that will also drive investment, and create jobs, and clean energy. So we know that doing nothing is not an action. I'm excited about the legislators' work in the forthcoming days. Uh, we. Uh, we uh, wish them well. We know they're working really hard on, on these bills. If we can talk about our vaccine efforts uh, for a moment, uh, by the end of this week, if not today, we will have administered 5 million doses of COVID vaccine, 5 million doses in the state of Washington. More than half of our adult population has received at least one dose. And so we know that our vaccine strategy certainly is fully operational, but we do need people to, uh, to to come in and to get the vaccines. We're administering close to 60,000 doses a day in our state. 
And the good news is we have the capacity to do much, much more than that today, assuming we get more doses from the federal government. But obviously having confidence in the vaccine is important for people to come in and get the vaccine. So we need to, all of us, I think, need to help one another build confidence in the vaccine. Uh, and we need to, that's important for their lives, it's important for our, our lives, and it's important so we can get back to really normal days of work and school and play and sports and everything else that we value. We have heard, I'm sure you've heard people that have said, well, I'm kind of on the fence on this vaccine. Uh, being on the fence is too dangerous a, a position right now. We still have 300,000 people over the age of 60 who have not received the vaccine. And these folks are at risk right now. And here we have a very safe vaccine. Over 90% of physicians have already got the vaccine. And I know if people ask their uh, medical provider, their doctor, their physical therapist, their chiropractor, their, their dentist, they'll get some good advice. And I'm sure they'll be advised that this has been a, demonstrated as an extremely safe vaccine and is safe to use. So we hope people will talk if they do have any questions about it with their medical practitioners and just ask them a question. We're confident if people do that, we're gonna have more people get the vaccine. Uh, now, if you, if you haven't gotten your vaccine, you can get your appointment, you can find it through our Department of Health and that's at vaccinelocator.doh.wa.gov. It's on the screen and we have a phone number there as well. And there are multiple languages available as well. Now, we have a situation we're dealing with right now. I wish it was otherwise. Uh, the situation is we'd like to be done with the, the virus, but the virus is not done with us. And that is demonstrated by the uh, fact that we are now are seeing a potential uh, wave. And I'm gonna ask for the different graph to be put up here. No, there's another graph that shows the numbers. If you can put that up, please. You, I think we might've skipped that graph that I wanted to show. Uh, the other one showing the daily case counts. So unfortunately, we now are seeing the beginnings of a fourth surge in the state of Washington. This basically shows our case counts on this graph. And you'll see we've had three previous surges. We have been able to knock down those waves when they have hit us because we've been smart, we've been made decisions based on science, we've worn masks, businesses have, have been responsible, and as a result, we have, we've been able to knock these previous three waves down. Unfortunately, um, again, can we go back to the previous one you just had up? I wanted people to be able, there we go, okay. I do want people to just look at this graph if, you, if you're interested, because we have a fourth wave developing on the right side of the screen, you'll see a, a relatively sharp increase, which also shows it's going up in age groups, particularly in younger folks. This is the beginning of a fourth wave, and we are starting, unfortunately, at a higher level than the other waves have started from. That's bad to start at a higher level, obviously. And we know that we're not as high as we have been in the third wave or even maybe the first wave, but we're heading in that direction. And that is simply too dangerous to persist. Uh, now I'd like to show you uh, uh, our hospitalization data, if we can put the hospitalization graph up. Maybe I was showing the hospitalization graph. Okay, so we have our hospitalization are also rising in addition to the case counts. And this is dangerous, obviously, uh, because this is not just on testing. These are really people going to the hospital. And these are going up as well, unfortunately, at a rather uh, significant uh, pace. Uh, we also ha have uh, shown a, a distribution where younger people are now getting it. And, and their rates are rising faster than in the older population. This is very, very disturbing. Now, why is this happening? One of the significant reasons is we have new uh, mutations of this virus, variants. These variants are, in some of them, more transmittable and possibly more dangerous. And we believe that the presence and increase of the variants is one of the reasons we're seeing this spike. On the screen now, you've seen a graph, and basically what this shows is the distribution of the varieties of this virus. And what you'll see, the red, is perhaps the most dangerous virus. This is B117, 
and this shows the scale moving to the present on the right side, you'll see the red is increasing as time has gone on. And uh, two other varieties you'll see in the blue and the purple are two other varieties. These are now well over 50%. These varieties, these new mutations, are now well over 50% of the total load of our virus. This is bad news for us because these are more transmittable. Each person with the, the same disease can transmit it more easily. And the science is highly suggestive that this is a significant reason why this virus is now increasing in our state. So we have to be extremely adept at, uh, at attacking this virus, uh, not just by increasing the folks who get the vaccine, but by continuing to mask up, to socially distance, to keep our, our get together small, and importantly, to take it outside because we know when we take our operations outside, they're much, much safer because we don't have confined uh, air circulation. So we're encouraging people to do that in all the circumstances we, we possibly can. As I noted, hospitalization rates are also going up significantly in our 20 to 59 year olds, even faster than our older groups. This is extremely concerning and here's why. As we know, a, a higher percentage of our fatalities have been in the older Washingtonians, but we are now finding an increasing number of people, 20, 30, 40 year olds in the hospital with very significant illness, sometimes very prolonged illnesses for months. And so this is an, of increasing concern for the younger folks in our community, both from the perspective of reducing the transmission because these are folks who are out and about but also just to protect themselves because this, these, these variants are now biting the younger population big time. So all of us at every age have an interest in getting the vaccine and all of us at every age uh, ought to have an interest to wear a mask and be careful as we go about. So we just want folks to be alert to that, uh, what, the fa what we face right now. Now to talk about the course of this pandemic and also I hope they'll make some comments about the safety of the vaccine I'm joined by Dr. Dave Carlson, Chief Physician Officer at MultiCare Health System in Pierce County, and Dr. Dan Getz, Chief Medical Officer for Providence Sacred Heart Medical Center and Holy Family Hospital in Spokane. We also have Lacey Fehrenbach here uh, to answer questions. Dr. Carlson, thanks for joining us. Looking forward to your comments. Thank you, Governor. Um, so uh, I can describe our situation in multi-care. It's clear that um, we are seeing some rise in cases in the community and um, a slow increase in the number of patients who are hospitalized. It is not as, uh, the spike is not as fast as we've seen in other waves. And I think that is largely because of mitigation efforts and primarily because of vaccination of the most vulnerable population, particularly the elderly that drove the hospitalization. It's clear that, um, as you stated, uh, our hospitalizations are being driven by a younger cohort, uh, you know, between ages, you know, 20 and 60, um, and largely those with comorbidities. So uh, diabetes, um, obesity, uh, lung disease. Um, but th there are differences in how we care for them. Um, so we're seeing, um, we're seeing less uh, ICU hospitalizations, less intubations, um, and uh, a quicker recovery uh, a little bit, and notably a bit easier discharges because they're younger and healthier to begin with, even though they may have you know, longer term effects uh, of the disease process. We've seen a few breakthrough cases, but to my knowledge, we've not seen those in our hospitals. So that's good news, the vaccines are working. Um, and I think you know, if I could reassure our communities, at the current time, MultiCare is well prepared to uh, manage the, the, the safety and the, the people that need care in our community, and both those with COVID and those without. And in the early waves, we saw people delay care, and we saw harm as a result of that. We're not seeing that at this present time, and I would encourage people who have problems, medical problems, please, please come and see us. Uh, so we are prepared to meet the growing need of our population, and if we need to, um, change or adjust uh, how we're doing things in our hospitals, we're prepared to do that with the protocols we put in place in combination with all of the other hospitals in the state, uh, and we continue to work on that. Um, our modeling that we do internally, uh, we watch that carefully so that if we do see 
a place where we need to um, adjust our hospital operations and increase capacity, that we're prepared ahead of time to do that and not reacting to a bad situation. In regard to vaccines, I think that is the one thing that we can do to help this. And the reason we're not seeing the effects that we've had before is because of the rate of vaccine of that uh, population that already has been eligible. That has made an unbelievable difference. And if we continue to rapidly vaccinate this younger population that is now uh, at higher risk, we will have significant impact on the disease and the burden that's placed on our communities. And in fact, we'll get to open up and go back to a more normal state much faster. It's incredibly important that we continue the efforts of masking and social distancing and great hygiene and to follow the protocols that are in place, that will help us as well. And addressing vaccine hesitancy. So this is very striking to me. And, uh, you know, our population of multi-care, we're hovering between 55 and 60 percent of our, uh, our workforce being vaccinated. And it appears that, that, uh, that the demographic that is hesitant to get vaccine in multi-care is exactly the demographic that is hesitant to get it in the community. So uh, non-Hispanic whites are vaccinated at a high rate, the minority populations at a low rate. This is really critical that we address it and that we uh, have strategies in partnership with our community, which we're working on very, very much to address vaccine hesitancy in high-risk groups and in groups that have um, far less trust in our systems uh, and our, our hospitals and our leadership so that they're reluctant to get the vaccine. So I think that's the job at hand, and uh, we look forward to partnering with uh, our health department, with our governor, and with all of our local partners to increase vaccination rates and particularly target those who are uh, vulnerable and hesitant. Thank you, Dr. Carlson. And uh, Dr. Dan Getz, looking forward to your comments. Yeah, well, thank you for allowing us to share what's happening at Providence Healthcare and our health partners in Eastern Washington. Uh, we've seen a steady and worrisome climb in patients with COVID, and patients are getting younger in terms of both hospitalizations and even deaths. Recently, we've seen some very sick patients in their 20s, and we're also seeing more patients hospitalized in their 50s. And while the patient numbers are currently manageable, keep in mind that we're asking nurses and doctors, respiratory therapists, really the whole healthcare team to, to put on PPE and go into these rooms after just finishing a, a fairly recent wave months ago. And frankly, our, our caregivers are really tired of seeing people die of COVID-19. Um, today, we, we really need your help. We need help in remaining vigilant with masking and social distancing. And most importantly, we, we need people to get vaccinated. Uh, in Spokane, we've partnered with Gonzaga University to provide, provide large-scale vaccine clinics uh, here in our community using the Pfizer vaccine, which has been administered safely to hundreds of millions of patients worldwide and is incredibly effective at preventing severe COVID-19 illness. Um, however, we filled less than half those available appointments. And as of today, uh, we have a clinic with nearly 1,500 available appointments that are open. Um, we're doing a big outreach push through social media and our media partners, uh, in addition, reaching out to 16 and 17 year olds through school systems since we offer the five Pfizer vaccine. But we're just disappointed that we're not seeing uh, uptake yet of those appointments. Um, we are grateful that people seem to be masking indoors for the most part, uh, doing what they need to do to keep the community safe. But we have seen in certain age groups, um, you know, increase in, in riskier behaviors, having large gatherings at houses um, without masks. And this is really risky behavior, especially for unvaccinated individuals. And being younger does not guarantee you from, from getting this disease and having a poor outcome. Um, really, the COVID vaccine is the tool that solves the pandemic. But until we have broad vaccination, it's critical that we continue to mask and social distance. The next few weeks are going to be critical, um, focusing on COVID safety precautions, especially as we're seeing these, um, in certain cases, more infectious COVID variants become more common in our state. Um, we don't want another surge. Uh, our healthcare system needs time to recover from the last surge. Um, and we need everyone to do their part, including get vaccinated. And with our current supply of vaccine, future deaths from COVID-19 are preventable. Uh, thank you, Dr. Getz. Dr. Getz, let me ask you. So there's all kinds of false information circulating out on the, the social media, conspiracy theories and the like. What would you advise people about how to deal with that, how to get the straight scoop on the science of the safety of, this, of these vaccines? Hey, Governor, I think you hit it on the head in having a really frank discussion with your healthcare provider. Sit down with your doctor and, and discuss the merits of safety in the vaccine, potential complications and risks. Uh, you know, I never dreamed we get to a point where we have the key to solving this. 
and we'd be slow to recovery because people are scared of taking something that's been clearly shown using science in, in administered hundreds of millions of times to be safe. And so I think when, when we as physicians research these vaccines, we look at peer-reviewed medical literature. And so I encourage people to have discussions with professionals that are educated on how to interpret the data rather than going to social media like Facebook and trying to gather your information from there. Got it. Well, I guess you're suggesting medical practitioners are ded dedicating their lives to science might be more credible than some folks in their pajamas in your basement. Is that what you're suggesting? There's a good reason I don't work on my own car. There you go. Okay, well, thank you. I want to respond to Dr. Uh, Carlson's comment about our need to help some folks and communities of color and those who, who have language uh, issues other than, or, or proficient in other languages other than English. Uh, we are doing uh, Herculean efforts to make this vaccine available to these uh, communities. We're doing outreach in 32 languages. We've just uh, doubled our, our campaign through the paid media through multiple, multiple Spanish language channel radio stations and television stations and the like. This is a very important part of our effort. And we do encourage everyone to try to make sure that equity is very important in the distribution of our vaccine and access to the vaccine. And we're gonna continue these efforts. I'm proud that our max vaccination sites now uh, receive appointments uh, in multiple languages by the phone, in case you're not computer, uh, uh, you know, eligible for using computers. Uh, we've gone to more accessible hours, so they're available in the evening, so people who can't get off work. We're trying to do everything we can but all of us have an opportunity to help our loved ones, our community members to, to have more confidence. And if they have more confidence, we'll, we will get vaccines to these folks. I'm confident of that. Uh, a couple things before I take your questions. I want to say that the latest round to apply for the state COVID-19 immigrant relief fund is now open. I previously allocated $62.6 .6 million for this fund, which helps workers who have been impacted by COVID-19 who are not eligible for federal relief because of their immigration status. And we're able to help 60,000 individuals who've needed it, who had no other resource. This round of applications is funded by an additional $65 million allocated by the legislature. These are hardworking folks who are paying their taxes. And I'm glad we've been able to extend a hand during this pandemic. Applications are being accepted through May 21st, and you can find the application and more information at immigrantrelief. Excuse me, immigrantreliefwa.org, and the numbers on the screen to give them a call. Uh, before I take your questions, I want to respond to some misinformation that has been disseminated, unfortunately, by a Republican legislator who is flatly wrong, and uh, we want to clear up any of, of that confusion. With that, I'd like Nick Struley to address the. Uh, uh, the fact that we are providing Pierce County a pro rata share of vaccines. Uh, Nick Struley, who's in charge of our uh, efforts in this regard. Thank you, Governor. Vaccine allocation and distribution is a complex process. At this point in time, Pierce County has received exactly 100% of its proportional share of vaccines from the state. They've been allocated more than 488,000 doses, and we continue to work with their public health leaders to ensure our process is working. Our State Department of Health works incredibly hard to ensure our vaccine doses are allocated equitably to all counties in Washington. And there's multiple factors that inform allocations from week to week. It includes the pro rata population of eligible groups by county based on the current vaccine prioritization phase, data from each provider in every county about the amount of vaccines they're requesting, the populations they serve, and the type of storage they have available for the vaccines that we're able to allocate. Information about the provider inventory on hand, the historical throughput of each provider, and whether providers are using and meeting our 95% uh, uh, requirement for uh, using vaccine we deliver to them. Anytime a county falls behind in pro rata, we engage very directly with that county to work quickly to catch them up and make sure we understand what happened. The process has evolved considerably as time has gone on. For example, the federal government has dramatically increased their direct distribution to providers outside of our state allocation. At this point, more than 200,000 doses per week, or about 35 to 40% of the doses delivered to Washington, are sent directly from the federal government to providers. The state does not have control over which providers the federal government allocates to or the geogra geographic distribution of these doses. 
An additional complexity of this process is that some of the providers the federal government sends doses to do not report to our state DOH system, so those vaccinations don't appear on our DOH vaccine dashboard. The best example of this is the Department of Defense or Veterans Administration doses. We know that tens of thousands of individuals have been vaccinated with these doses in Washington, civilian and military, many of them in Pierce County. But unfortunately, that data and information isn't able to make its way into our, our state DOH dashboard. We all share the goal of vaccinating Washingtonians and getting shots in arms equitably and quickly. It's a complex process and our state DOH and local public health are doing a really phenomenal job to make sure that each county and community is getting their fair share of those doses that we at the state level have control over allocating. Back to you, Governor. Thank you, Nick. Bottom line, Pierce County is getting 100% of its pro rata doses from the state of Washington. This is clear, unequivocal fact, and anybody who says otherwise is simply wrong. So we wanted to clear that up. We hope it's adequately reported. But with that, I'm happy to stand for questions. All right. Up first, we'll go to Rachel LaCourt with AP. Go ahead, Rachel. Hi, Governor. You mentioned the two climate bills that are still in conference committee. Are you confident that lawmakers will reach agreement on them by Sunday? And if they don't, would you call for a special session specifically on, on those measures? And then on a separate bill, this afternoon, the Senate declined to concur on language. The House added to the capital gains tax that would prevent a referendum. Have you talked to lawmakers about that bill's progress and what version of that measure would you like to see come to your desk? I haven't talked to them since the event that you've, you've talked about. We, uh, as I've indicated on many occasions, I believe our state needs a fair revenue system that's fairer to working people. And I'm hopeful that they achieve a, a provision that has an excise tax, a capital gains tax on those who are very wealthy. And this is a very limited proposal and I support it, and I've, I would support multiple versions to get this job done. So I hope they get it across the finish line to my desk. It is a fair thing to do to working people. On the climate bills, our state needs action on climate. And what I can tell you is I, I think there's a reasonable opportunity to, to make big changes and big progress this year on two bills, and I'm looking forward to progress uh, on both of them. And I think it should be achievable. There's no reason that it should not be. I don't delve into timing. We'll talk about that as the time goes on. But I know there's some hardworking legislators who don't want to see on Earth Day uh, an inability for us to, to match this. We have made a commitment to our children in our law. And now uh, I know legislators want to stand up and meet that commitment in both of these bills. All right, up next, we'll go to Joe Sullivan with the Seattle Times. Go ahead, Joe. Governor, two-part question. Uh, you'll be signing a budget here, uh, presumably, in a couple of days. Curious to get your thoughts on, you know, the growth of the budget over the years, as well as uh, another increase this year, uh, what that reflects values-wise for the state and whether you're worried about the long-term sustainability of that. And then second, do you fear a referendum of the, the capital gains tax going to uh, voters this uh, fall? No, people understand basic fairness. We know that that our revenue system has been very unfair to working people. They they sometimes pay four and five times more when you're on the bottom of the pyramid as a percentage of your income at the top. And this very modestly makes it a little more fair system. And this money can be used to help working people and will be under under any budget that, that succeeds in our state. So it's a very reasonable proposal. It's very limited. Uh, 40 most uh, vast majority of states already have this provision. So I think it's a very reasonable proposal. Uh, your first question was, you had another question there, Joe, didn't you? Your values wise and then worries about sustainability. Yeah, no, no, the, these, these numbers are sustainable. We've had very rapid economic growth. I think there's a reason to believe it will continue. Washington state has been listed the, the best state in the United States in the last two years, both times. And one of the reasons is because we have such a diverse, robust, and dynamic economy. We don't have just one leg of the stool. And this is one of the reasons why we've been listed the best state in the United States. And that is a reason to have confidence that our economy will continue to grow and that these measures are sustainable. And what this says about our, our state is we care about each other. We care about our kids. We want them educated. 
We care about our health care. We want to have health care for our population. We care about homelessness. It means we care and it means we're confident in our future. And I think both of those are fundamental Washington values. All right, up next, we'll go to Laurel Demkovich with the Spokesman Review. Go ahead, Laurel. Uh, hi, Governor. I have one question for you and one for Lacey. Um, for Lacey, can you talk at all about when you might or when we might anticipate seeing, um, I guess, vaccines beating some of this, these uh, rises in cases? Like when will we start to see this fourth wave go down? What will that take? Um, and then for the governor, the legislature passed a bill that you requested to change the makeup of local public health boards. Um, so I'm just wondering your thoughts on that final bill, especially given uh, that the big chunk of it, which would have regionalized public health uh, districts, is now gone. Lacey, do you want to start? Sure, I can start. Thanks for the question. So. Uh, we are seeing an impact on vaccines already in terms of disease in Washington state. Uh, we, while we're seeing an increase in cases and an increase in hospitalizations, the slope of increase is not as steep as what we saw in November, for example, uh, because fewer people are susceptible than back in November. The other thing I will say is when you look at the hospitalizations, they are increasing. Uh, but not as significantly among those who are vaccinated, those people 65 and older. So the first thing I want to be very clear about is that vaccines are making a difference in the course of this pandemic you know, across the country and in Washington state already. Think about them as your offense in the football game. Um, the reality is, though, that in order for us to turn the corner on this fourth wave, we can't stop playing defense. Vaccines alone, an amazing offense alone, is not going to get us all the way there. We have to keep playing defense with those community mitigation measures that we know work. Wearing masks, watching our distance, keeping our social circles small. Keep in mind within your household, your family, every group that someone is part of, your work site, your sports teams, your church, etc. all those things increase your risk. They are really important things for us to do, but we have to undertake them carefully and we have to be selective about them. So keep your social circle small. And as the governor said, take it outside. So good defense, good offense helps us win the pandemic. As far as the public health bills, we, uh, I haven't seen the final version, but I understand that it will have some improvements in the composition of the public health boards to make them more, more accessible, more representative of the local community. So I do think that is progress, and I'm happy that we've made some progress in this regard. All right, up next, we'll go to Sarah Gensler with McClatchy. Go ahead, Sarah. I have two questions. They might be for Lacey, they might be for you, Governor. Um, watching these trends and hospitalizations, do you have a feel right now for how close statewide ICU bed occupancy is to triggering a backslide for the full state in reopening? And then uh, if and when the federal government recommends states resume vaccinations with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, what does that approval look like for Washington and what role might the Western states group play in it? Lisa, do you want to talk about J&J? Well, in fact, why don't you talk about both those? If we still have Lacey. So um, the, a reminder that the threshold for the ICU occupancy statewide uh, is 90%. We're not there yet. We do monitor it closely. Uh, and part of you know, using this dial approach is hopefully we can avoid getting our state to that threshold. Um, and I'm sorry, can you repeat your question about J&J &J and the Western States Group? Yeah, it's uh, if the federal government, if and when they recommend restarting vaccinations with that vaccine, uh, what does the approval look like here and what role would the Western states group play in it? Sure. So um, we are, of course, very closely looking at what ACIP, uh, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices and CDC and FDA release after they complete their review. Um, similarly, the Western States Group will uh, look at the data as well and give us information from that. I, I think, you know, we want to deploy as much vaccine as is safe uh, and available out to Washington communities. And so, you know, we're going to follow the science on this and we're 
optimistic that uh, when this unpauses, uh, we can go forward and use this vaccine. Um, how rare these effects have been, you know, less than one in a million, apparently, of the reported cases, that is less than the chance of being struck by lightning. And it is certainly many, many, many times less than some of the some of the side effects you might have from a variety of drugs that we're used to taking from oral contraceptives to other things. So we think this is an extremely positive thing at the moment for our state, but we'll wait to get the full scientific evaluation. All right. Up next, we'll go to Jerry Cornfield with the Everett Herald. Go ahead, Jerry. Uh, thank you, uh, Governor. I had two-part question. Um, first, just on the vaccine, uh, in, when you were in Arlington Tuesday, you talked about a slowdown in demand, which I take to mean is different than a vaccine hesitancy. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what is the slowdown in demand you're seeing and are we headed to having a surplus? And then secondly, uh, you wanted uh, a transportation package of some sort this session. Doesn't look like it's going to happen. I wanted to wonder if you could reflect on what you think occurred and what is your plan in the interim to deal with the preservation needs, maybe the I-5 bridge over the Columbia River, what you might be doing on those subjects? Well, as far as uh, there has been some very modest signs of, uh, of a modest slowdown in uptake in a couple of regions in our state, and that has happened nationally as well. This is not a shock. It's in like most uh, situations, you have a spectrum of you know, how eager people are, and the people who are most eager come in first. So it's not a shock, but we do want to do everything we can to share scientific information with people so that we can get more people vaccinated. And we are doing that. We are going to have a very, uh, I think, fair-minded, scientifically accurate campaign to provide people information. I met with our DOH yesterday about that, and I think they're going to do a good job. You will see uh, uh, PSAs on TV and radio and other places talking about the fact that physicians have approved this as a very a safe vaccine. So we will need to do that so that we get more people to get vaccinated. Look, as I've indicated, we still have 300,000 people who are senior citizens who are not vaccinated today. And I tell you, that's, you know, that's troublesome to me because these folks are you know, very much at risk for a fatal disease. And, you know, it has been a joy to see our deaths come down dramatically because we have about two-thirds of our seniors who are now vaccinated, at least one dose. But that still means there's 300,000 out there that are not. And obviously, you know, millions of other folks who now are, are getting these variants that seem to be potentially more dangerous for young people, certainly more transmittable. So uh, it is a concern. We will be addressing it. We have plans to do so and all of us have a role to do this. I do kind of reiterate that when I talk about this, that it's not presidents and governors who are the only people who can be leaders on this. All of us can be leaders with our loved ones. Uh, my wife today just got good news. She, she talked somebody in our, you know, one of our extended family groups of getting a vaccine. You know, that's maybe one life we've saved. So that's a good day. And all of us can do that to encourage people to, uh, to really save their lives and, and help us re return normalcy uh, uh, to our community. On transportation, um, uh, you know, we still have a lot of work to do on transportation. That's absolutely clear. I still remain committed as I was from day one to get a transportation package. We still have considerable unmet needs from trestles up north to the I-5 bridge over the Columbia and all kinds of projects and maintenance Please do not forget maintenance. We have huge maintenance needs. So those remain, and we will continue to work on it as diligently as we can. Uh, the chambers were not able to reach an agreement that could pass this year, but that's not reduced either our appetite or my commitment to getting a package. It's very important for the state of Washington, from safety to economic growth, uh, it, it, we really need a transportation package, and we will keep working on this. Uh, even while the session's not uh, in place. Lacey, did you have anything you wanted to add on that one? Uh, just quickly on the um, demand side, I, I do want to um, point out that, you know, there is still significant demand for a vaccine in Washington State. 
70% uh, of Washingtonians are open to receiving the vaccine, according to the latest polling data. We're just hitting a different phase of the administration. So in the early phase, there were wait lists, and, and in some places in the state, there still are wait lists, and people will go to great lengths to schedule their vaccine um, and get themselves there. What we're seeing in terms of a change in demand is now we have to um, reach out and make it really easy for the people that are open to it, but not banging down our doors to get a vaccine. So make it accessible to them, make it easy for them. And if they have questions, be open to answering those questions, um, sharing our own experiences. If you get vaccinated, uh, answering questions, dispelling myths among your friends and family members, as the governor shared, uh, he and his wife have done, um, that, that does save lives and it does get people um, to step forward and, and roll up their sleeve uh, and, and, and take the vaccine. So want to encourage uh, you all to be good citizens in that regard. Uh, the other um, quick thing we wanted to remind people, if you happen to have multiple appointments, once you get your appointment, we want to encourage you and get your dose. We want to encourage you to cancel those other appointments because another challenge we're seeing in some communities is a lot of no-shows. Um, and we do believe that, that that is because people have booked multiple appointments, they get their vaccine at one place and they forget to cancel those other appointments. So um, that will help others be able to access vaccine nearby uh, in the local community. Mostly, listen, we have to understand what we're, what we're up against. We have a rapidly mutating virus that is in, 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 infecting and invading our state. And it has an ally, and that's the social media and the internet, because that new technology allows mutation of information. Uh, and a lie, as it's been said, can travel around the world three times before the truth gets out of bed in the morning. And that's what people are up against, trying to get the straight information about this vaccine. And they hear all kinds of conspiracy nonsense about this vaccine. So we have to provide as much channels of information as we can to them. And I just encourage people to Look, if you had cancer, you wouldn't go to your auto mechanic to figure out what to do about it. You go to your physician. So we do encourage people who have any questions, concerns, call a medical practitioner and ask them to get the straight scoop. Uh, that's something you do when your life is at stake and, and people's are, lives are at stake when it comes to this vaccine. If people do that, we're going to be just fine. All right, up next, we will go to Essex Porter with Cairo 7. Go ahead, Essex. Thank you, Governor. Uh, considering what you have said about a fourth wave and the charts that you've shown with the line going up, is May 3rd too long to wait to begin additional measures to slow down that third wave, like additional rollbacks? Uh, no, we don't think so. Not at the moment. Not at the, not at the rates we're seeing. We think it's a reasonable period. This is always uh, a challenge for us between predictability and flexibility. And we're trying to give the community a little predictability for three weeks on this. We think that is the right move at the moment. Now, that could change. This We've got to be willing to roll with the punches, too. But at the moment, looking at the slope of the curve, uh, and our, our uh, uh, increased vaccination rates, we think this is the right approach. All right, up next, we'll go to Jessamine McIntyre with Q13. Go ahead, Jessamine. Thank you very much. Uh, a kind of piggybacking off of that when it comes to the phases, Governor, how close would you be to taking the entire state back a phase? We know we're going with the county approach, but there are some in crisis right now. So is there a point at which you would take the entire state back? Uh, yes, the, you, we're dealing with speculation at the moment. Sure, I'm sure that possibly things could happen. I'm not sure it helps a lot to just speculate about that. We have a plan. We have been successful largely in our state. As you know, we've saved thousands and thousands of lives because we've had uh, both response to the science and an approach based on science, and, and we're continuing on that approach. All right. Up next, we'll go to Hannah Scott with Cairo Radio. Go ahead, Hannah. Hi, Governor. A couple of questions for you on legislative uh, progress. 
George Floyd, the, the, the verdict, of course, came in this week for Derek Chauvin, just as many of the bills for police accountability were passing out of the legislature heading your way. That, of course, includes duty to intervene and independent investigations, which came from your task force. I wonder if you can speak to some of what has already passed and is uh, at your desk or on its way. Well, yes, uh, I think this is going to be one of the bright spots of this legislative session because the legislature responded, uh, I think, with uh, a, a great deal of both the ambition and wisdom on how to respond to the uh, terrible violence that we have suffered. And they have done so with a variety of bills. As you know, uh, I certainly asked for the independent investigation bill, very, very important police accountability bills. They've done several things. And I really appreciate the work they've done on this. And I'll tell you why. These have not been uh, just knee-jerk bills. They've been very thoughtful. They've considered amendments. They've considered multiple viewpoints in these complex issues. And I think they've landed in some very, very beneficial way to, to reduce violence between uh, law enforcement and citizens, at the same time being rational about how they've gone about it. So I, I, I'm very pleased with their work product. A lot of people have gone into this. You know, I, I saw I heard Representative Jesse Johnson this morning on your station, by the way, while I was shaving, I think. And uh, I really appreciated his approach to this, which was he listened to a lot of people. He didn't just go in this with, a, you know, an ideological hammer. So I, I really appreciate the work product that's coming my way. Great. We've got time for two more. We'll up next, we'll go to Keith Eldridge with Como. Go ahead, Keith. Yeah, Governor, um, going off of Essex's uh, question, and I'll, uh, May 3rd is coming up, and it's appearing, and you're talking about speculation, but it looks like uh, it's, well, Snohomish and King County are going to join Pierce County and the other counties in going back to phase two. What are your concerns there? Are you rethinking the, the metrics or the, the restrictions at all? No, not at this moment, and uh, I would not prejudge those things. Uh, I would not make those decisions right now. We're going to wait and see the, what the science and numbers tell us, but right now we're not thinking about changing uh, the metrics. Uh, the virus is what it is. It's increasing. We can't ignore it, and we have a rational approach uh, with, with metrics, and uh, so we're not thinking about changing those at the moment. Um, I do hope also that we made it clear about Pierce County uh, on our vaccine numbers today, too. I hope the public is gets that information. All right, we've got time for one more question. So we'll go to Ian Smay with Crime 2 News. Go ahead, Ian. Yeah, so Spok here in Spokane, we're currently trending in the wrong direction to satisfy the phase three metrics on May 3rd. I was just wondering if you or anyone from your office have had conversations with health leaders here in Spokane about the trends and any efforts to get our numbers back down. I haven't recently. Uh, Lacey, do you have any communications you can address? Uh, yeah, we're regularly talking with the local health leaders across the state and in those communities that are seeing increases. Uh, you know, it, it is the combination of continuing efforts on vaccine, vaccinating uh, their population as quickly and equitably as possible and uh, keeping up with those uh, preventive measures in terms of wearing masks, watching distance. And also, you know, a reminder to everyone, if you think you might have COVID or you've been exposed, please get tested um, and, you know, follow the isolation or quarantine uh, recommendations of public health and, you know, to protect yourself and your community. Nick, did you have anything you wanted to add on this one? Um, I, just building off of Lacey's remarks, you know, we, we continue to have conversations with elected leaders uh, all, all over the state uh, about how best to help message the rising case counts and hospitalizations we're seeing in different areas. Uh, I had a wonderful conversation the other day uh, with, with Spokane Mayor, and, and she, you know, she was phenomenal. They're doing great things to try to message and have conversations with their communities about how to uh, continue to mask up and socially distance, and uh, we continue to to see those types of messages from local leaders in all the communities across the state are, are going to be helpful to us in turning, turning this fourth wave around. 
Yeah, I had a conversation with uh, Snohomish County Executive and Arlington Mayor the other day at the MAX vaccination site. We, we are all, in some sense, having these communications. And they, people, everybody has the same view. We don't want to go backwards. We, we want to reduce this, this virus. Nobody wants to go backwards in these phases for obvious reasons. And we also all know what we can do. Fortunately, there's things we can do, one of which is to get vaccinated. So I hope people are all pulling together to do that and continue to do these things we know that are safe. Any closing remarks? No, again, I, have, I hope you enjoy Earth Day. Uh, we have such a beautiful state here. It's worth fighting for. We're doing that in the legislature today, and I, I hope uh, all of us will enjoy the success that I hope we're going to have defeating climate change in our state. In the next few days, we have a chance to do that, and I hope we will do that. Thank you.